eight distinctions that we looked at in Romans chapter 9 in verse number 4 and 5 they are listed the Bible says in verse 4 who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption the glory the covenants the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose verse 5 are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. We saved the best for last. We're going to look at Jesus Christ this afternoon. The Bible says, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Romans 9 starts off with Paul reaching back to his own family tree, Israel, and he outlines their inherited blessings. That's the context. The Messiah belonged to Israel, except Israel didn't belong to the Messiah. <laughs> they rejected him. They put him on a cross. And they were not reaping the advantages given to them. Why? They cried away with him, away with him, crucify him. We, we will have no king but Caesar. Okay. Okay. It says, uh, John 19 says, shall I crucify your king? You know, the context of that is not us. Who was their king? The Messiah, Jesus Christ. They said, we shall crucify your king. And they put him on the cross. Now, I want to look at, well, well let me just say this by practical application. Young people, pay attention. You have some advantages that I didn't have growing up, and some men and women in this church didn't have growing up. You have some advantages that pertain to you, that don't pertain to some other children, because they don't have the opportunity to grow up in a church. They don't have parents that make the sacrifice to get them to church. They don't have parents that put aside other things, and instead of being on the ball field, uh, they, they come to the church house. You don't have you have advantages that pertain to you that don't pertain to a lot of children. What are you going to do with those advantages? You're going to put them on the cross. If <laughs> Christ went to the cross, that nation, God gave that nation a Messiah. And God gave that nation some advantages that pertain just to them. And they said, away with him, away with him, crucify him. We shall have no king but Caesar. If you want Caesar, God will allow you to have Caesar. You want an idol, God's going to allow you to have an idol. You're going to make a decision on, are you going to take advantage of the privileges that have been given to you by your parents? Christian parents are a blessing. You better not forget that, young ones, young people. But Israel had a special place in God's heart. Go to Genesis 32 and we'll need Psalms 113. Those will be our two starting spots. We won't stay there long, but I would like you to read along in Genesis 32. And the next spot will be Psalms 113. In Genesis chapter number 32, There's a wrestling match going on with Jacob. And verse 24, uh, and Jacob was left alone and they wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Verse 25, and it says, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Verse 27, and he said unto him, what is thy name? He said, Jacob. And in verse 28, he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And watch what it says in verse 28. For as a prince, hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. We're going to come back to some context with this and Jacob's name being changed to Israel at a later point in Romans 9. But what I would like to point out this afternoon for our context is that Israel means a prince of God. That's the meaning of the name. 
And that nation was given a princely place of recognition before God as a nation. So we'll, we will return to that at a later point, but know this afternoon that Israel means a prince of God. And in Psalm 113 will be our next stop. Psalms 113. It starts and ends the same way, this song. Praise ye the Lord, and then it ends. Praise ye the Lord. That's a great way to sandwich our life. It says in verse number uh, one, praise are you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Verse two, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun, the going down of, his, of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes. Watch this, even with the princes of his people, that's what God's going to do with that nation. Lift them up out of the dunghill. They are, they have a, a princely place of recognition with the Lord. And Israel really nationally, if we can make this application, they are what Christians should be spiritually, spiritually. We are lifted up out of the dunghill of this world. We should not be like other people. The same way Israel was not supposed to be like other nations. We are not supposed to be like this world. They can call us different. They can call us fanatical. They can call us whatever they want. We're supposed to be different. They call them sports fans. It's short for fat fanatics. I don't go and paint my face three different colors and um, yell and scream and shout and lose all sense of sobriety um, through drinking alcohol all day, cheering for a team that doesn't even know who I am. That's what sports fans do. Now, not all of them, but most of them, when you get them together, that's what the crowd brings. And they call them fanatics. It's okay for us to be fanatics about Jesus. We can lift our voice in public and say, Jesus saves. We can lift our voice privately with another individual and say, hey, can I tell you what the Lord did for me? Oh, you're kind of fanatical. It's not as out there as some, uh, as some of the behavior that sports fans get into. We used to do the Daytona Beach uh, uh, race, racing fans or some of the uh, – that's an interesting crowd. There, I mean, there really isn't much activity. It's just cars going around in a circle. <laughs> and it, but, man, I tell you, it brings out a crowd. It really brings a crowd out. Thousands of people come to that Daytona uh, 500 thing. And uh, – Man, they just, the, the behavior that they get into, it's the same thing with every year we do it. And those are the sports fans. Now, the Christians standing outside of that on the public sidewalk that are sober, well-dressed, not cursing, simply saying, can I tell you about Jesus? Would you like to take some, something to read while you're waiting? And... We're not supposed to be like this world. I got saved out of this world, amen. How about you? I don't want to go back. Got no interest. I got no excitement. I'm excited about serving Jesus. I'm excited about being different than this world. And we are set apart. He wants us to be set apart. Now, in Romans 9, when we look at get Romans 9 and then get 1 Timothy 3, Unpack some things here.
Romans chapter 9 and 1 Timothy chapter number 3. In Romans 9, we'll just look at it real quick. In verse 5, it says, And of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. Concerning the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the what? Flesh. How? By being born in a manger. If God was manifest in the flesh, who is this talking about? Jesus Christ. Isn't that obvious? There's only one born in a manger. There's only one that was manifest in that body of flesh. And he's called in, in chapter six, uh, verse 16 of chapter three, he's called God. Jesus Christ is God. You have in Matthew one, it traces that fleshly lineage through Abraham. In Luke chapter number three, that fleshly line is traced all the way back to Adam. And we have a resurrection line that doesn't trace a fleshly line. <laughs> it's a supernatural, he rose from the dead. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Let's go to the Old Testament. And let's get Isaiah chapter number seven. Isaiah chapter number seven. You can, you can preach on these verses if it's not December, by the way. So Isaiah chapter number seven. It says in verse number 14, Isaiah seven, verse number 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Who's the you? Well, okay, well, who needs the sign? The nation Israel, right? The Jews require a sign. Who is given this sign? Very obviously, Israel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We have a prophetic verse pointing to God who is manifest in the flesh that we just read about in 1 Timothy Chapter number three. Now go over to Isaiah nine. Look at verse number six. Isaiah nine, verse number six. For unto us a child is born. Well, who's the us in the context? Israel. Unto us. Unto Israel a child is born. Unto us, that nation, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Name shall be called on the counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Micah chapter number five. Micah chapter number five. Lord himself shall give you a sign. That's Israel. They're going to get a sign. Unto us, that nation, a child is going to be born. And then Micah chapter 5, look at verse number 2. But thou Bethlehem Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, out of that nation, out of thee, shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in, here it is again, Israel. We have three Old Testament prophetic passages that are pointing specifically to Israel, give you a son, unto us a child is born, to be ruler in Israel. He came through the flesh line of his people, and he was the son. He was given for those people. He is their Messiah. He came for that nation, but they rejected him. Now, we can look at all of these passages prophetically, and we know that Christ came. To save us from our sins, we know that we put our faith and trust in him. We know all of that. But doctrinally and contextually, when we look at Isaiah 7, we look at Isaiah 9, we look at Micah 5, he came for his people. 
We have to draw that distinction out as well. Go to the New Testament. Watch the confirmation in the New Testament. In Matthew 1, we'll start. Why don't we get Matthew 1 and Romans 1. Matthew 1 and Romans 1. Matthew 1. And Romans 1. Twenty-one. Matthew 1. 21. And she shall bring forth a son. That would be Mary. And thou. Shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save. His people. From their sins. Who's the thou and who's the his? <laughs> who's his people? The nation. At the time of his birth, that is who his people were. He came to save them from their sins. And he's going to do that. We talked about it before, so we won't do too much of a deep dive into it now, but we will return to it. But during that time of tribulation, he will tell them to flee to the mountains. They will do that. They will trust God. He will provide for them. Their safety, their food, their water, all of it. They will trust God to provide for them. The lights are going to go out. Then the glory of the Lord is going to come down. They're going to look up on him who have, they have pierced. And they're going to call upon the name of the Lord. And Israel will be saved, that remnant. So he is going to save those people. And at the time of his birth, that is who is people are look at verse 22 behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they israel shall call his name emmanuel which being interpreted is god with us the last verse well, well then joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the lord had bidden him took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Everything that we have looked at so far, you couldn't get away from the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Redeemer. In Luke 2, you don't have to turn there, but it says a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. He is overall. Romans 9, 5 says he is overall. The Gentiles and the nation. We're just drawing out some distinction. Romans 9. Or 1. I'm sorry. I should turn to Romans 1. Uh, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. See that? Made. Of the seed of David. People say, well, Jesus was made. According to what? The flesh. According to the flesh. And declared to be what? The Son of God. Jesus is God. God the Father didn't make God the Son. They always were. He was made according to something. The flesh. Because in eternity past, there wasn't. Of, of, there wasn't God manifest in the flesh. That's all that is. By um, And declared to be a son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, which transcends any flesh line, any seed of Abraham, any seed of David, any seed of anybody. And that's what separates us as true Bible believers, Christian, from every other group. They can't point to a supernatural resurrection. I tried to lay, lay all that out for two reasons. Israel was given the Messiah that pertaineth to them. 
and they should have received their Messiah. But they didn't. Now notice there's eight of them given in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5. There's eight pertaineth to Israel. Eight is the number of new beginnings. If they would have received the Messiah, you know what they would have received? A new beginning as a nation. But they didn't receive him. So you know when that's going to happen? At his second coming. And they will be born again, and they will receive their Redeemer. But Romans chapter 9, verse number 5, is a beautiful, phenomenal verse on the deity of Christ. And this is the second reason why I laid out this framework is because this verse is used to attack the deity of Jesus Christ. Mainly the Jehovah's Witnesses is the main sect or the main cult, the main group that will use this verse to attack Christ's deity. And they say that some translations render this verse in a way that would identify Christ as almighty God. Duh. <laughs> yeah. And then, for example, and then they will co quote the King James Bible. Now, if you don't believe me, you can just check out JW.org and they will tell you, you go to this verse with them. They tell their people that there is an error in the word of God. And so they remove it. And the New World uh, Translation says, God, who is over all. To be praised forever. Amen. In other words, Jesus, they're okay with Jesus being over all. They're just not okay with Jesus being God who is blessed forever. So we need to be careful of that. All of us, especially if we get an opportunity to witness who Jehovah's Witness. They're very adamant that Jesus is not God. Anybody else have a problem with that? I do. I do. And they need to know the truth. Jesus very clearly, this is a deity of Christ verse. In Romans 5, verse number 9, we cannot move any, we, we just can't lose ground on that verse. The Bible says, wherefore God also has highly exalted him, Jesus, and gave in him a name which is above every name. That's Jesus. That the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. If God, the father is saying that Jesus should be praised and blessed and equal with me. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses need to get on board with that. Show them Romans 9, 5 in conjunction with Philippians 2. And some of the other verses that we talked about. And take them through those scriptures. And let them read and see for themselves. Back to Romans 9. Get two other places. We'll get Acts 20 and 2 Peter 2. Acts 20. Second Peter two. We'll start in. We'll start in Acts twenty. Uh, many other people will deny our Lord's deity by saying that Paul never said Christ was God, and that's just an outright lie. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Who is that? Jesus Christ. He purchased the church. First Corinthians 6 says, for you are bought with the price. 1 Corinthians 7 says, you're a vault with the primes. 2 Peter 2 says, 
they denied the Lord that bought them. <laughs> they recognize that he's Lord, but they deny him. They even go so far as to recognize that he bought them, but they deny him. They deny that he bought them. The Bible says, I have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, you couldn't miss it that Christ purchased the church with his blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 7. First Peter 1, real clear, we were bought. bought. How do you recognize false doctrine? Second Peter 2. Second Peter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people. Okay, how do we identify them? Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Okay, how do we identify? Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Okay, what are they? Even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. Jehovah's Witnesses or any other group or individual. That would deny that the Lord bought. Is a damnable, damnable person. And we must confront. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I think we need to hear it as much as possible. I thank the Lord that we have the freedom to go out in public. I thank the Lord when we get horn hocks and thumbs up and, you know, pats on the back. We appreciate you being here. I appreciate all of that. I know you do. But I believe the Lord would have our work to be more fruitful if we unpacked and had to do a deep dive with the Jehovah's Witness that at the end of the 30-minute conversation, you feel completely drained because you have poured as much spiritual energy that you could into a lost person that needs the Lord. Look, I love hearing other saved people say, out of boys. We need the out of boys. We need the out of girls. <laughs> but we need to be praying that the Lord would send some of those that are believing these damnable heresies so that we can contend for the faith. So that we can go to these verses and say, will you consider looking at these verses again? They need the Lord. And if in our town, Pilgrim isn't going to bring it to them, then shame on us. That's why, we, that's why we are here. That is why we exist. We meet within the church house, and then we go out and reach the lost. We bring them in. So that's how you, fall, you fall, spot that false teacher. Um, a couple more verses, and we'll, we'll finish out. Go to Romans 1. Romans 1, let's get Hebrews 2, and Colossians 1, and then we'll finish. Get our spots here. We're in Romans 1, Hebrews 2. And Colossians chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 will go first. Romans chapter number 1. Bible says verse number 3 concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. 
So if all things were made by him, and Romans 3 says, Jesus was made of the seed of David. How do you fit that together? Because Romans 1, 3, again, it's according to the flesh. Before Jesus was manifest in the body of flesh, before he was made as a body of flesh, all things were made by him. and Without him was not anything made that was made. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, Jesus was just a created being by God. No, read John 1. He made all things. In the beginning was the word. He's the incarnate word. Romans 1, 3 is, yeah, he's made according to the flesh. Stay on that. Park on that. When you're talking with someone who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That Jesus being made is specifically his humanity. It's specifically the dwelling place of the body of flesh that he was manifest into. Romans 1 with John 1 will help figure it out. John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. See that? If in the beginning was the word, nothing was made without the word. He made all things. And then it says in, in the verse 14 of John 1, and the word was made flesh. You, get, you see that? You got the word that made all things. And then all of a sudden, the word was made into a human body of flesh. And you got to keep parking on that. Look, it's simple for us because we've had it our whole lives. Some of us. But it's not simple for a Jehovah's Witness. It's not simple for that group. They have been taught completely the opposite. So they have to be retrained. They got to be unlearned. Hebrews, Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. Verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. But why are you telling me that, Lord? <laughs> but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Because he didn't come to die for angels. He came in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh. This is why the manifest in the body of flesh, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. Hebrews 2, look, didn't come in the form of angels. He came in the form of, why? Like sinful flesh. He came like us and lived 100% percent sinless. Connect those dots. Romans 1. John 1, John 1, 14, and then Hebrews 2. There's a specific reason. He's identifying with us. Colossians 1. Last place we'll flip to is Colossians 1, verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There are two kingdoms. One is a physical kingdom. One is a spiritual kingdom. Physical kingdom of heaven, we talked about that. Israel's name. The spiritual kingdom of God is the kingdom. That is the kingdom that is in function that in functionality. The kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom that we are born into. It says that we have been translated. Well, if you were under the power of darkness. And now you've been translated. That tells me that the principle of translation means that the original isn't there anymore. Have old things passed away? Behold, all things are become new. It's not there anymore. It's gone. And you have been translated. And now as you... Because you and I have been translated, we are better off 
than our original condition. And there is no way, there is no way that any of us want to go back to the original. We have something better. We have been translated into a better kingdom. We're better off because of it. Because God translated us. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. Oh, sorry. That's what the NIV leaves out. <laughs> I just got a little. You think his blood's important? I do. I'm singing it in the hymns. I'm keeping it in my book. Because this Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The blood needs to stay in the book. Even the forgiveness of sins. With the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. But make sure you got through his blood in your Bible. For by him all were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Heaven was created by Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus Christ is the designer. Jesus Christ is the creator. Jesus Christ is the author. It's all about. Him, him, all Christ. For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That claim is not made to anybody else. In his human form, in a body of flesh, dwelled all the Godhead. It's in him. He is the fullness of all things. Colossians, if you, I can't wait to go through verse five. I love Colossians as well. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There he is, Jesus Christ, the fullness of him. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about all things are under his feet. Let's start, let's finish where we started in Romans 9 and close out this thought. All things are under his feet, which would say, which would really connect the dots on Romans 9, 5. It says, Christ came, who is over all. Well, God, all things are under his feet, and he has to be over all. And then it ends, God bless forever. And then Paul gives himself his own amen. 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 It's that good. It's that much of a, of a doxology. And he says, Amen. God blessed forever. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.